All right, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna get into the details of actually approximating the areas under a curve given an interval. In this case right here, we're looking at the interval, again labeled A to B. Our first job is to gonna split this interval into equal subintervals. We're gonna label these points where we make this split. This will be a partition or a regular partition of this interval. We'll, start, we'll call A the first part X sub zero, X sub one will be the next cut, X sub two, all the way to X sub N, which will be B or the end of that interval. When we create a partition like this oh, on this interval A, B, it's important also to note that the first interval would then be X sub zero comma X sub one. The last interval over here would be X N minus one X N. This is the first subinterval, and this would be the last subinterval. So the, the ith interval, so for, when we're going through this, like the third interval or the ith interval specifically would be uh, x sub i minus one comma x sub i. And, and this is really important for the, what we're going to define next as far as our approximation strategies. So the ith interval ends with x sub i and starts with the i minus one. Also very important is that if we take this interval AB and we split it up into N equal intervals, each interval will have the same width. And that width can be calculated by taking B minus A or the, the, the length of the entire interval and dividing it by N. We're gonna denote this by this delta X. So this is the change in X for every interval. These pieces of information are gonna be really important for the two approximation strategies I'm about to show you, the left endpoint approximation and the right endpoint approximation. And I just wanna clarify this. So the width of the interval is this. So when we create these little rectangles on every interval, this will be the width of those rectangles. The height of the rectangle will be defined by how we choose what function values. We're either gonna choose the leftmost point of these subintervals or the right. So specifically here, if we took this, let's take this interval right here and let's just call this x sub i minus one and x sub i. So this is an, the ith interval. What we want to decide is if we're gonna create a rectangle, do we, are we gonna use the left-hand side for the top or the right-hand side? That's what we're gonna define right here. That's fairly important. But let's just say if we use the left, it would look something like this. And so on every interval, we would choose the leftmost edge of that subinterval as the height of this rectangle. All right, the two approximation techniques then that we are going to use to approximate the areas under the curves are either using the left endpoints of each of these subintervals, the, the ith interval will be this left side of each of these, or the right endpoint. And it's important to have both of these because these will give us a, some kind of bounding for the area. Um, as we'll see in future examples, if our function is increasing, the left endpoint approximation will really underrepresent what the area actually is, and the right endpoint approximation will actually give us an upper bound for what that area is. So we having both of these, we can kind of sandwich in the actual areas. So left endpoint approximation, as spoken a second ago, we label this as L sub N. The N represents the number of intervals, which will define this delta X, which is the width of each of these subintervals. But this is found by adding all these rectangles. And so in this case, the first rectangle is the function value of X sub zero. So the function value right here gives us the height. The width then we multiply that by delta X to get the area of that rectangle. The second rectangle, rectangle would be f of x1 times delta x. And so we're gonna add all of these. I'll skip this and just go to the last rectangle here. This last rectangle has a height of this function value of x of n minus one, right? So the left-hand side of that last interval times delta x. Now this is where it's actually really useful to have this sigma notation. We can define, we can use sigma notation to define this sum right here. So more simply, L sub n is the summation from i starting from one to n of x sub i minus one, right? So in this case right here, we're starting at one, but we want this to go to zero all the way up to n, our last, our last function value is n minus one, which we put plug in n here, we will get n minus one times this delta x.
Alternatively, if we use right endpoint approximation, now on each of these subintervals, we're going to choose the right endpoint of the interval for the height of this rectangle. We denote this in the same way, r sub n, which is right endpoint given n number of intervals. We calculate this. Now what we do is we're going to take the function value from the right-hand side to construct this height. So the first rectangle will be f of x1 times this delta x, which is still the same. It's the same width of each of these subintervals, which is fairly easy to calculate given the width of the interval and the number of subintervals that we're creating. The second interval, or the second rectangle in the interval will be x, f of x2 delta x. And then the last one, which is important, will be this last interval right here. We're going to choose x sub n, or that last partition point, which is actually the same thing as b, to be our height here. So this will be f of xn times delta x. Then, so when we look at both of these, they are very similar. The difference is we're shifted over just a little bit, right? In this case, the function values are all of these left points starting at zero and ending at x sub n minus one. Here, we're starting at x sub one and going all the way to xn using the right points of those subintervals. And again, to use the sigma notation, which is the nice way to clean this up and seeing why we introduce this sigma sum notation at this point. We're gonna start when i equals one. We actually want f sub one, so this will be the x sub i times delta x, which is the width on each of these. All right, now that we have both of these labeled for what we're actually trying to do, it's important to remember this formula right here. Understanding what the ith interval is also important as we move forward to understand what we're doing with this kind of notation. But let's do a couple examples, a couple simple examples to get our feet under us with using these approximations. Okay, in this example, we're being asked to estimate the area under x squared from 0 to 2 finding, by finding L8 and R8, or the left endpoint rectangles and the right endpoint rectangles. In this work, the first thing I want to do is to define or to find this delta x, so then I can find these subintervals. So the delta x, which is the width of each of these intervals, is calculated with this formula we just had, which is the width of the interval divided by the number of subintervals. In this case, that would be 2 minus 0 divided by 8, that would be 2 eighths or 1 fourth. So our 8 sub intervals on the interval from 0 to 2 will each have a width of 1 fourth, meaning each of our rectangles will have a width of 1 fourth. Next, we want to get a reminder of what the, the definitions of these are. L8, in this case, will be the sum from i equals 1 to 8 of f of x i minus one, so this is the left-hand function value for each of these, times this delta x, which in this case is one-fourth. So again, visually what we're gonna do for each of these is for each of these intervals, we're gonna construct a rectangle using the left part of the, uh, the left side of the sub-interval as the height. If, since our first is zero at zero, we'll start there, and then we'll have our next rectangle, which will be right there, then for the third, like this, and then all the way down. I mentioned this a second ago, but this is really important. These left endpoint rectangles, because this function x squared is increasing on this interval, right? This, since this is increasing and we're using this left endpoint, this estimation for the area will end up being a lower bound for the actual area. None of these rectangles actually are outside of the area, and we have these little gaps we haven't accounted for. And as mentioned before, if I chose like L16, I'd have these smaller angle, smaller rectangles, which would create smaller gaps and get me closer to the actual area. But that's, that's more than enough work. Let's do this right now. Let's do the work of actually calculating these terms. We have eight terms to calculate. We have the function values, which are the left endpoints of each of these intervals to calculate. And we're going to multiply those by the one fourth. All right, so here I have the expanded form of this sum right here. Again, each of these are calculating the areas of each of these rectangles. This first one, f is zero, will be zero, given this first area, which is obviously zero. But each of these terms, as previously described, 
It will calculate the area of each of those rectangles. You'll also notice that we start at f of zero, which is the leftmost point here, and we end of f of seven fourths, which is the start of this last interval. I also want to make an important note right here is that what we could use is the sigma property that we could factor out this, this constant of one fourth. And, and why I would often do that when calculating these, I wanted to sh model and show you this, where we have these areas of these, these widths of one fourth times these heights of the function value of the leftmost point. Okay, now what I've done then is just evaluate each of those function values for the heights of each of these rectangles. And I have this here. Now my work is to multiply each of these terms and add it all together. I have previously done that. And what I got is the, an answer of 35 sixteenths, which is equal to 2.1875. And again, this will represent, given our picture and the fact that this function is increasing from zero to two, this will give us a lower bound for the area. I want to emphasize, and hopefully it's obvious, but I really want to make this clear, the left endpoint approximation isn't always a lower bound. If this function was decreasing on this interval, this would actually give us an upper bound because those leftmost points of those subintervals would be higher than the, than the endpoints, right? So if it's decreasing, your, your beginning of your interval would be higher than the end of your intervals. In this case, since we're increasing, the leftmost endpoint is less than the end of those subintervals, giving us overall a lower lower bound approximation. You might be thinking this, and then I get this fact that this math of what we're doing here isn't the most exciting. We're just adding a bunch of things together, calculating a lot of values, but we are on the verge of something very cool. We're, we're going to be able to get very, very clear approximations, then tend towards exact values for the areas under these curves. Let's now do the exact same treatment here, but now use the right endpoint strategy. The general setup again is the same for R8. We need these eight subintervals of a width of one fourth. Now in this case, when we construct our rectangles, instead, what we're going to do in this first interval is go up to the right hand side of the interval and construct our rectangle. So each of these rectangles will now just be outside of the actual area. This is why this will give us an upper bound. Also why if we're increasing on this interval and we use the right endpoint approximation, we'll always get an upper bound for the area, which is why it's useful to have both of these. So then we have this bounding for the actual area. So now what we're going to do is calculate these areas of these rectangles. And this will look very, very similar, except for we're not gonna start at F of zero. We're starting at F of one, which is this one fourth, and we'll end up at F of two is the last height for our rectangle. And so here we have now the expanded form of this sum right here. Again, each of these calculating the areas of each of these rectangles. Now in this case, starting from this rectangle, it now has a height of f of one fourth and ending with this rectangle has a height of f of two. Let me again show that all, all the work for this and get our value for R8. And then multiplying and adding these values all together, I got that the estimation, the right-hand endpoint, R8 estimation for this area is 51 sixteenths, which is equal to 3.1875. And then to recap, what we know is that L8, we calculated that to be 35 sixteenths, which was equal to 2.1875 as a lower bound for the area between zero and two for X squared. We've just calculated that R8 was 51 sixteenths, which was equal to 3.1875. This gives us then a very accurate range for the area under the curve of x squared between zero and two.